Welcome to lecture 14 of financial risk management. The topic that we are covering in this lecture is determination of forward and future prices. Moving on to the contents. So previously we started this chapter of finding the intrinsic value of a forward or future contract and we developed our concept of short selling and the basic idea of intrinsic value. So in this case, in this lecture, we are going to understand continuous compounding. You would have already understood it in your introductory courses of finance, but we would just review it quickly. And then we will cover different types of assets. There are different categories or different ways to classify assets but in this case we are just going to classify asset for the purpose of finding their intrinsic value and we are going to classify assets into investment asset and consumption asset and then the reason for classification is because the method of finding the intrinsic value would be different for each type or subtype of the assets so the the method of finding the intrinsic value of forward contract in case of investment asset would be different from that of the consumption asset and within investment assets we would have multiple subcategories they would all have a different method of finding the intrinsic value so starting with the concept of continuous compounding we first need to understand compounding frequency. Compounding frequency is how many times the interest is compounded annually or in a year. So for example, if we say that the interest is say for example 10% compounded annually, that simply means that this 10% is paid once a year. So if we draw a timeline, this is today and this is after one year. So this one 10% is paid after one year on our deposits. If we say that the interest is 10% annual, so we are using the term 10% annual interest but it is compounded semi-annually. That means that the interest is paid once after six months and then again after six months, which would be one year, right? And in this case, the interest would be 5% and 5% again. So the interest is 10% annual. So if we, if we, add them up we would have a 10 percent interest but they are compounded semi-annually in case of monthly compounding you have got the idea that interest would be paid each month so if we say that interest is 10 percent annual but it is compounded monthly or for the sake of easiness let's say quarterly then we would have four quarters. We have four quarters in a year. This is one, two, three, and four. So if we divide this by four, we would have a 2.5% interest each quarter. So if we sum these all interests, then we would have a yearly or annual interest rate of 10%. But they are paid quarterly, right? So obviously the same interest rate, but the higher the frequency of compounding, the higher would be the uh, interest amount. So I leave, so I leave that uh, an exercise for use. What you can do is take 1000 rupees and just compound it once a year for 10 percent find the answer it's that one is easy then what you can do take 1000 compound it for 5 percent 
so you would get the answer after six months then you can compound the whole amount uh, whatever the the principal amount and the interest rate combine them add them up and then again calculate a 5% interest you would get a higher answer as compared to the, this one so anyhow uh, this is basic idea and I, I hope you, you you all know so what my uh, our concept is continuous compounding now what is continuous compounding so when we say that compounding is once a year so we can say that m which is the frequency of compounding is one if compounding is twice a year this frequency of compounding would be two if compounding is quarterly then frequency of compounding would be four so semi-annually it would be two or quarterly it would be four for monthly it would be 12 for daily it would be 365 and what if the compounding is infinite times the frequency of compounding is infinite that means that compounding is done each second of a minute <coughs> then we we call that concept as continuous compounding so what continuous compounding is when the compounding frequency this this frequency tends to reach infinity then we we call that concept as continuous compounding so when we have continuous compounding how do we find the uh, future value say we deposit 100 and we deposit it for one year the interest rate is 10 percent or 0 0.01 <coughs> so how do we find the future value in simple case in simple future value formula our formula was present value into 1 plus r raised to power n right that is what formula we used to find the future value so we would this this would be our present value this would be our n and this this would be our r and the rest you can do but in this is when we this 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 is what we apply when we have different compounding frequencies but not for continuous compounding in case of continuous compounding our formula would be different this a is basically present value we would multiply it by e and e is a constant whose value is 2.718 or this is the button that you would find at the bottom of your calculator uh, where you find this equal sign or the answer sign you can press alpha and the e button so this is the constant value for e so our formula would be present value into e raised to power r n or rt whatever you call it so so if i put these values in it then it would be 100 into 2.71 raised to power point, uh, 0 0.1 this is a 0 0.1 it is 10% right into n which is 1 so now you get an idea that when we are going to perform continuous compounding that we, then we are going to use this formula <coughs> so instead of multiplying it with 1 plus r raised to power n we are going to multiply the present value by uh, with, with e raised to power rt or rn so once we get this idea of continuous compounding uh, this is because we are going to use this continuous compounding in our future value or forward uh, in our forward pricing concepts in this whole lecture we are going to use this e and this continuous compounding concept one thing that you need to remember from here on whenever we are going to estimate the price of a forward or future contract or an option we are going to use continuous compounding instead of the compounding for different frequencies right so continuous compounding is the way to go <coughs> so let's get to our different types of assets we have investment asset and then we have consumption asset so investment asset is an asset that is held for investment purposes by a significant number of investors there is no clear-cut definition for these types of asset 
what we how we are differentiating between consumption and investment asset is by how that specific asset is used by most of the investors so if in case most of the investors uses an asset for investment purpose then we would call that asset as investment asset and if that and a specific asset is used for consumption purposes by most of the investors then we would call that asset as an investor asset uh, consumption asset sorry for example uh, we take the example of common stock shares bonds these are the assets that are used for investment purposes i mean no one consumes stocks or bonds i mean i'm, I'm talking about shares company shares corp corporations shares the shares that are traded in stock exchange we don't consume them there is no way of consuming them consumption by consumption we, we do not just mean human consumption we consumption can also be industrial consumption so we can use for example copper can be used uh, for investment purpose and for consumption purpose uh, we use copper in our devices our our electrical devices electronic devices uh, we, we make all different kinds of products using copper so how would we categorize the shares and bond we would obviously categorize them as an investment asset because by most investors by most people these assets are used for investment purposes what about uh, silver or what about say uh, copper copper is normally used for consumption purposes so we would categorize copper as a consumption asset gold is a tricky asset some people would categorize it as an investment because we we hold gold for investment purposes their prices tend to increase they are scarce commodity and they are also traded in in commodity exchanges but we also consume gold uh, in shape of jewelry in shape of and these gold are used in our electronic devices in in different processors they have good conducting power so gold is tricky to categorize but in case of our course we are going to categorize it for investment purposes but again we we can debate on it okay so first we are going to understand the investment assets how do we calculate the forward price of investment asset and then we would going to calculate the forward price for consumption asset so so starting with investment asset we are further going to divide this investment asset into two categories one is called a uh, non income paying investment asset so so non income paying investment asset and then we have income paying investment asset right i would abbreviate it income paying investment uh, assets <coughs> income paying assets so for example a zero coupon bond remember zero coupon bond is the bond that do not pay any interest how would you categorize it in income paying investment asset or non income paying investment asset we have already discussed bond is an investment asset obviously it is a non income paying investment asset what about a coupon bond it would be an investment asset remember coupon bond is the bond that pays some interest right <coughs> then we have uh, different stocks some stocks uh, by their policy they do not pay dividend so if they are not paying dividend then how would you categorize them they would be categorized as, as non income paying investment asset but if there are uh, stocks that pay dividend continuously pay dividend then they would be categorized as income paying investment assets so we have categorized investment assets into sub categories and the reason is the 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 idea of estimation would be different for both the sub categories 
So we have uh, invest income paying investment assets and then we have non income paying investment assets. So consumption assets, we have already discussed it, is it asset that is held primarily for consumption purposes. So most of the investors held an asset for, for consumption as purposes. So we have copper, we have oil, we have other commodities that are mostly used by for consumption purposes. <coughs> So investment asset would be further divided into non-income paying investment assets and then income paying investment asset we have looked into it and then we would have consumption assets. So we start with the income paying investment assets and let's understand how we are going to estimate the forward or future price of uh, non-income paying investment. This is the simplistic uh, form of, uh, of calculating the forward price. So we start with this simple one. So non-dividend paying stocks or zero coupon bond, we have discussed that they would be categorized as non-income paying investment assets. The formula would be F0, <coughs> F0 stands for forward price, so forward price today or it can be future price is equal to S0, S0 stands for, uh, I have already written here. So F0 is forward or future price, they, they are both the same. Remember in our previous chapters, we were denoting it with K. <clears throat> then S0 is the price of the underlying asset today in the open market. T is the time until the maturity of the contract. <clears throat> R is, is the risk free rate. And uh, E is the constant and we just saw in our slide of continuous compounding its value, it is a constant, its value would be 2.718. So we are going to use this formula to find out the intrinsic value of the forward price. So let's first calculate and then we are going to discuss further. <coughs> Starting with the example, consider a long forward contract to purchase a non-dividend paying stock in three months. So what this means is first you, whenever you would encounter this non-dividend paying stock, non-interest paying bond, that would simply mean that it is a non-income paying investment asset. So as soon as we encounter the this types of uh, a wording in a question we would simply get an idea that it is a non income paying investment asset. So by three months it means that this uh, forward contract would mature would expire in three months this is the expiration time uh, so this is our T. In our previous formula you saw that the formula was F0 is equal to S0 into E raised to power RT so T is three months. Assume the current stock price is 40. So you would have probably assumed that it is S0. So current price is S0. S0 is today's price. Go back to the previous slide and you would have an idea. And the three months risk free rate. So this is our R risk free interest rate is 5% per annum. Suppose the forward price is 43 in the market uh, for the same maturity. Now, what we find from this formula is forward intrinsic, the true value, the value that should be if there is no arbitrage opportunity. So this is the intrinsic value. This is the value that should be there for arbitrage opportunity not to exist but the market price can be different, right? So uh, I have just assumed that suppose the market price is 43. So we, we would come back to this one, but first we need to calculate the intrinsic value. So the first idea is to calculate the intrinsic value and then we are going to compare it with forward market value. And then we are going to make a decision uh, whether to we can earn a profit or not. So this would be the second part uh, if the forward price is less than uh, if it is 
39 right so we would ha have a look at this one later on but first the first one so how would you find the forward price uh, it would be f naught into uh, is equal to s naught into e raised to power rt we put the values f uh, s naught was 40 we saw that in the previous slide this is uh, the constant or you can use your calculator button to input this value <coughs> The interest rate was 0 0.05 and R was because the contract matures in three months but the interest rate that had been given is per annum so we find we we, we divide the uh, maturity by 12. <coughs> the answer is 40.50. So this is our FI we call it FI to distinguish it with fm which is so this stands for forward, forward intrinsic value the true value so when this forward intrinsic value is equal to forward market value <coughs> then what would happen is there would be no arbitrage opportunity there would be no arbitrage opportunity and by no arbitrage opportunity we mean that there would be no opportunity to earn a riskless profit that's what arbitrage is <coughs> so when uh, f intrinsic is equal to f market we do not have any arbitrage we cannot earn riskless profit but what if fi is either greater than the market price or it is less than the market price then obviously we do have an arbitrage opportunity so in this case in this specific scenario our fi is 40.5 so we clearly can see that our fi is less than fm remember in previous slide we said that fm assume fm is 43 and our fi is uh, we have calculated our fi as 40.5 so this is our calculated this is the market value so if this is the case if forward intrinsic is less than forward market then one thing we know that there is an arbitrage opportunity we can earn riskless profit but how do we earn riskless profit what strategy what steps do we need to take to earn this riskless profit forward market is a tricky business right